Pro wrestling isn't always good. As a matter of fact, a lot of the time it could be pretty bad. But very rarely is it so monumentally terrible. And today, I bear witness to such a rarity, as I'm looking at what is considered to be, by many, the worst wrestling pay-per-view of all time. Now, going into this, I thought that had to be an exaggeration, but coming out of this, I'm realizing it was actually an understatement. Heroes of Wrestling was a one-off wrestling pay-per-view that was initially meant to continue on as a franchise, which is sort of made clear throughout the show when they're setting the groundwork for a sequel that will never come. Which is why, despite being billed as a Legends event, they still introduce relative newcomers to a wider audience, and make Captain Lou Albano the commissioner to a company that does not actually exist. The show is historically horrible, but before this review, I actually hadn't seen it. Which is kind of surprising, as anybody who knows me knows how much I love a dumpster fire. So join me in seeing if this lives down to expectations. A spoiler alert! It does, and it also sinks lower. This show is infamous for not being well thought out, or... Well... Well. There are plenty of familiar faces here, though not all the names are the same due to copyright reasons. Sensational Sherry Martell is now Sensuous Sherry Martell. The former Bushwhackers are now called Men at Work. Too Cold Scorpio becomes... Too Cold Scorpio. And Yokozuna becomes... The former Yokozuna. That's actually, that's it. That's his name. The former Yokozuna. Which, I guess is factually correct. But you could have maybe followed that nickname up with his actual name? Like, if you were to call this man the former Yokozuna, that's an accurate description, but that's really only a moniker and not an actual name. What is he presently? When it comes to wrestling shows, there's a lot of room for error in your first outing. Which is great for this show, because it's got a whole lot of that and not a whole lot of anything else. Audio issues, bad camera work, crappy storylines, a commentator who doesn't know any of the moves but still feels inclined to call them like he does, and a ring announcer who doesn't seem to know what he's doing but is just real happy to be there. This has it all! With that in mind, let's see why this company's first show was also its last one. In the first matchup, it's a match of halves, as one half of the Rockers teams up with one half of the Fantastics to take on the Samoan SWAT team, which only consists of half that team. You see, despite being labeled as the Samoan SWAT team, this wasn't the Samoan SWAT team most fans were used to, as at the time, one half of the former Head Shrinkers, Fatu, was busting a move in WWF with Too Cool. So in his place was his brother, the former Tonga Kid. The three teamed up together in WCW previously, so it's not like this pairing was unwarranted. It just feels weird seeing the two together without him being billed as this. Especially when the associated photo representing the team doesn't actually represent the team. Because that's just a picture of the Head Shrinkers. Don't worry, even commentary gets confused as they continue to refer to the Samoan Savage as Fatu. The SWAT team makes their entrance alongside wild Samoan Sika, but more attention is put on their manager for the night, Paul Adams. Adams proceeds to cut a promo that no one asked for that really does nothing for anybody aside from alerting the audience that they're the heels. He completely overshadows the team he's allegedly managing, with the spotlight being put on him. The cameras are much more focused on the guy talking rather than the two guys just standing there. And Sika is hardly ever mentioned on commentary and isn't even credited for this match in the promotional picture. The match is off to a slow start, with both teams doing some crowd work, and it continues that way for a while. The pairing of Marty and Tommy feel really out of place together. Despite their history of being in tag teams, their inexperience as a tag team together definitely shows. Their work together feels sloppy, and the two sort of step on each other's toes all throughout. However, I think individually, when those two aren't working together in this match, they both do a pretty solid job. While both men have impressive tag team resumes, together a dream team they are not. The Samoan SWAT team dismantles the offense pretty decisively. This match at times is a little sloppy and a little slow, but all things considered, it's, you know, a match. It's not a great match, but honestly, it's not terrible. And by the end of the night, it's probably one of the best matches of the night. That doesn't speak for the quality of this match, but more so the quality of this show. It's a battle of the middle nicknames as George the Animal Steel takes on Greg the Hammer Valentine. 
Before the match, George Steele is shown walking around backstage with Sherry Martell, his new manager, until he decides to disrobe her? Okay. Cut to shortly thereafter, where Sherry talks up her latest acquisition, the animal. But when he shows up, she has to lure him away by lifting her dress up and walking off. Well, at least we know what his motivations are going into this match. Both men make their way to the ring, where George attempts to eat a turnbuckle and Greg attempts to greet George's manager. Strangely enough, shortly into the match, Sherry turns on her client, choking him out and scratching at his eyes when he's blinded by his own shirt. Now that makes sense as Sherry was primarily a heel during her run. She's best remembered for being at her worst. But what makes no sense is booking her as a face only to immediately turn her heel in the opening moments of a match. There's also this weird gimmick where because Steele was blinded, he didn't notice the betrayal, and instead trusts her with an object after the fact, which she then promptly hands over to the hammer. The two trade blows with this unidentified object until eventually the hammer gets the win. I don't know what happened with the finish here, it seems like they just repeated the same spot twice for some reason, but I can tell you I'm not a fan of it. As Valentine and Sherry celebrate their victory, the animal tosses the sensational one out of the ring. The heels make their exit as George throws chairs and eats a nearby turnbuckle. Then for some reason, Valentine returns to hit Steel with a steel chair, at which point the animal chases the hammer back to the back. This match is a walk and brawl without the benefit of being outside the ring. It's back and forth punches with very little else. It's a dud of a match with a strange story and an even more bizarre finish. I don't know if I can even call this a finish because it happened toward the beginning of the match. What, what a mistake. And, and I don't just mean the match, I mean what a mistake in, in putting this together. What a mistake on my part for watching this. It's just, it's, it's all bad. I, I just, I would rather be doing anything else than going through the rest of this, but I... I will. Relative unknown Julio Fantastico, who feels misplaced at an event called Heroes of Wrestling, cuts a promo talking about being the best Too Cold Scorpio would ever face, and claiming that he'd never lose another match again. And it, it, it it's not great. It, it's like a baby's first heel promo. You know, the, the guy's not exactly Dwayne Johnson here. But I'm willing to bet that this probably wasn't this guy at his all-time best. As a matter of fact, uh, thus far, it feels like everybody on this card has been at their all-time worst. So I'm going to give this guy that same benefit of the doubt. Too Cold Scorpio enters with an accompanying photo of him being in his Flash Funk days, complete with his Funk University gear. Wouldn't that kind of be like advertising The Godfather with a picture of Papa Shango? Like, you're not wrong, but you, you, you're definitely not right. Too Cold Scorpio enters the ring carrying a WCW Championship replica, and I can't find any case of Too Cold Scorpio being a reigning champion anywhere at this point in time. So I guess he was just really psyched about his latest toy store purchase. During the match, wrestling legend, real-life Super Mario, and Cyndi Lauper's dad, Captain Lou Albano, comes out to join commentary. He has a couple fun quips, but mostly he just does his best to be a spokesperson for the show, and regurgitates lines from his past promos with half the passion he once had. The two wrestlers go back and forth, flipping through a chain, and you know, it's not bad. As a matter of fact, the two combat each other's attacks pretty well. The two trade drop kicks and arm drags all throughout the match. These guys have unique styles and it's interesting to see them work together. Although admittedly, at times it can look like they're working in slow motion. Like the first match, it does come off a little bit sloppy. There's a bunch of botches and mistimed spots. Including the match's climax, which they even replay in slow motion for some reason. Speaking strictly as a spectator, it does seem like Julio was a little wet behind the ears at the time. I don't think I've ever seen somebody run the ropes like that. But he showed a lot of promise. Even Captain Lou on commentary seems to speak on his inexperience. Uh, throughout the a couple of years of experience, he'll keep progressing to that point. Right now, let's put him on 100%. I'll give him like an 80, 85. That doesn't make sense. Despite this, he showed a lot of promise. Regardless, the match certainly has its moments, with the two countering each other in interesting ways and flying through the air with the greatest of ease. They make their way outside the ring and into the crowd, taking out a couple of kids in the process. The former Flash Funk gets the victory with a flying miss in an alright match for the show that it's a part of. Afterward, Captain Lou Albano is made the Commissioner of Heroes of Wrestling, as previously mentioned, and then King Kong Bundy cuts a promo on his opponent, not Yokozuna. Nothing of importance really happens in either segment, so we move on to our next match. A classic tag team match 
between two classic tag teams, as the former Bushwhackers, the men from Down Under, Luke and Butch, take on the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov, with their manager, Nikita Brenzinov. I am probably mispronouncing that. Interesting thing to note, for some reason Luke and Butch share a pitcher, but they needed two separate pitchers of the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. I don't know, just it's not very aesthetically pleasing. And speaking of not being aesthetically pleasing, everything in this match. The match starts off on a low note, as the two teams don't ever seem to find a rhythm and just sort of bump into each other all throughout. Taking some of the more bizarre bumps I think I've ever seen in wrestling. It's, uh, it's not great. It's clear that for one reason or another, whether it be due to age or injury and probably a mixture of both, that not everyone in the ring was in ring shape. The two teams are very lightly landing each other on the mat. The offense is so light, as a matter of fact, that both teams hardly remember to sell. The crowd is over the match as soon as it begins, as they remain silent all throughout. There's some fun character work with the Iron Sheik threatening to leave the match if the crowd continued to chant USA, but no amount of smoke and mirrors can disguise this for the blatantly bad bout that it is. Even calling it a match sort of feels like slander to pro wrestling. It was a mistake, like the rest of this show has been. This is pretty horrendous, and despite the best effort of all those involved, pretty hard to watch. The match ends with Volkov hitting one of the used-to-be bushwhackers before accidentally nailing his partner with the unidentified foreign object so that the legal man from down under could get the pin. Did you understand what I meant with that sentence? Because I watched this and I said it and I still have no idea what I just said and what I just witnessed. After the match, Sheik and Volkov tease a falling out before hugging it out and continuing on because they have many, many, many more bottom-of-the-barrel bad indie shows to attend. Up next, the former Four Horsemen takes on a former Midnight Expresser. Tully Blanchard goes one-on-one -on -one with Stan Lane. Before the match, an angle ensues where we see the Pinnacle's manager jumped in the parking lot by Ric Flair's protege. Later, Tully cuts a pretty great promo, showcasing his skills as one of the most underrated talkers in the history of the game. He talks about his issues with Stan Lane, and compares it to the same hatred he's had for his greatest rivals. He says he'll take on his opposition with all the anger he's had for all of them combined. The promo is way too good for the show that it's a part of. In just a little over three minutes, Tully manages to make this match feel important. Which is no easy feat when something is being billed as a grudge match, but they've only just now found out about this alleged grudge. Sweet Stan Lane comes down to the ring to cut a standard heel promo, talking himself up by down-talking his opponent. Even going so far as to give his own in-ring introduction. Add on to it that he's rocking a short blonde sting cut, and he really just comes off like Mr. Kennedy's dad. Stan continues to insult Tully as he makes his entrance causing one half of the Brain Busters to rush to the ring. This is a very old-school bout between two old-school guys. It's kind of what you'd expect. There's a couple of strange bumps taken throughout. The match definitely gets relatively rough, both for the two involved and the people having to watch it, with the fans who were invested eventually just giving up. In an effort to make up for the lack of audience participation, the commentators discuss the fans being mesmerized, while the camera continues to cut to fans looking far more concerned with anything else. The match eventually ends in a pretty confusing way. So confusing, that commentator Dutch Mantel has to explain to his fellow commentator what actually caused the finish and who it was that won. Stan Lane was allegedly cradling Tully for a pin, not realizing that his shoulders were on the mat. So he was also being counted for the pin. So both men were being counted for a double pin, except Tully kicked out at two. Why? Who did this benefit? What an awful ending to an already awful match. This match got my hopes up and then immediately reminded me what show I was watching. Now look, say what you will about the actual quality of the match itself, it's not the best effort either man has ever put forward, I think that's pretty obvious. But they managed to tell a story both before and during their match. They made it matter if even for a couple of minutes. You know, this was must-see until it was actually seen. Whatever goodwill it drummed up, it lost it in the end. Not great, but definitely not the worst that I've seen on the card, and definitely not the worst that there is to be seen on this card. 
After the match, we go to the back to get a promo from Jim the Anvil Neidhart and King Kong Bundy, who are now aligned for reasons we'll get into later. Hardcore fans rejoice. Legends Abdullah the Butcher and One Man Gang have a match that's going to wind up getting this video demonetized. But essentially, imagine a big brawl with a lot of bleeding from both parties. Which is always a little bit uncomfortable to watch, but is especially uncomfortable to watch in hindsight. For... obvious reasons. What makes matters worse is that the blood literally gets everywhere. I mean, it is all over the place. They get up close and personal with the crowd, with the commentary table. It's also another match with a really weird finish, as after eight minutes of the two bashing each other with all kinds of weapons, the match is suddenly called off due to a double countout. So, you're in a hardcore match, but the ring out isn't turned off? Okay, seems weird to me, but you know what? Uh, nothing about tonight has felt normal, so let's just continue. The penultimate match sees the Superfly take on the Cowboy. Again, we get an angle before the match. And that angle is from above, as we see some surveillance footage of Bob Orton, Lou Albano, and Jimmy Snuka gambling at the casino. Until ultimately, it's revealed that good old Ace was cheating. A brawl breaks out, and a match is set. Both men plead their case. In Snooka's case, Captain Lou does it for him. Uh, he's just standing there, menacingly! The match is exactly what you'd expect from these two past their prime stars. It's plagued with timing issues and mistakes. You know, it's not bad. Uh, when you compare it to everything else in the show, it's a classic wrestling match that at the very least is watchable. I don't think this match is going to go down in history as the reason anyone ever got into wrestling, but it's a competent match performed by two great performers of their generation. They still do what they do well, for the most part. At this point in time, Superfly could still make you believe a man could fly. And Bob Orton could still make you believe that he could crush a man like a fly. Overall, I think the match's biggest sin is just having it go on for a little bit too long. At some point, it just stops being fun. They get the crowd going, but then the crowd wants to up and leave. Snooker gets the win after an aerial assault, at which point the crowd starts chanting at Bob Orton. I can't tell you what they're calling him, but let's just say it's not a maggot. Next up is another battle between two middle nicknames, as the snake takes on the anvil. Fitting for a show of this caliber, the main event remains the low point of the show. This is the worst at its worst. And before getting into the debacle that was this finale, I think it's only fair to acknowledge that the man we're about to talk about was in the midst of addiction and at one of the lowest points of his life, which thankfully so is not a representation of who the man is today. At this point in time, Jake the Snake's successful rehab stint was the talk of the town. So this show was looking to capitalize off his sober star power, but unfortunately, there was no sobriety to speak of here. Shortly before the show, Roberts would relapse in a big way. Before his match even began, he gave audiences a taste of what was to come as he drunkenly slurred his way through his promo. But man, even at his worst, this guy was one of the best. Even when he's more focused on playing with his hair like he's just suddenly discovered that he had it, he still knows how to speak though he is struggling to. I'm not saying that this was a good promo, but it's kind of crazy how charismatic this man could be when intoxicated. It's like he had the idea of a good promo, he wasn't in the right state of mind to deliver it. Luckily, years later he'd get a chance to do just that. Nightheart comes down to the ring already looking pretty uneased. And then Jake the Snake makes his way down the ramp. And then Jake the Snake makes his way back up the ramp. And then Jake the Snake makes his way down the ramp again. The audience comes to life upon his appearance, but he's clearly not in ring ready. The man is on planets that haven't even been discovered yet, hanging on to the ropes to keep himself steady, and working incredibly sluggishly as he staggers around the ring. He actually almost steps on his pet snake a couple of times here. Nightheart tries to work a match around his inebriated opponent, but it's to no avail. Eventually, Jake resorts to whipping out a snake a few times and jerking it around like it's not a snake. And then he starts tonguing it down, and I, I don't know what message he's trying to send here, but I, I know I don't like it. Nightheart rushes out of the ring and feigns fear. 
but literally can't stop giggling at Jake's antics. And this is when all hell breaks loose. Without rhyme or reason, King Kong Bundy makes his way down to ringside to talk with Jim Neidhart. The big man stands at ringside watching the anvil wrestle the human equivalent of an actual anvil, as Jim could barely get Jake on his feet. Roberts eventually briefly gets the upper hand, and even forces a camera cut after he flips off the opposition. Bundy finally involves himself in the match, when the former Yokozuna slowly makes his way down the ramp. Jake stumbles out of the ring as the heels battle the babyface Yokozuna, and during said beatdown, it's announced that this is now a tag team match. Following the announcement, out comes a little bald guy who the commentators begin to speculate is, in their words, a Little Bundy. So they start referring to him as Little Bundy, though the fans chant Uncle Fester at him. In actuality, this man's name was Michael Henry. And this wasn't even the first time we'd see this guy on our screens. As earlier, he served as the chauffeur for Tully Blanchard, and then again as security trying to bring One Man Gang and Abdullah the Butcher to the back. He's now apparently playing the role of heel manager, yelling at fans, whispering in the ears of the bad guys, and even choking out Jake the Snake Roberts during the match. But this man was not a manager. Even if his sudden appearance wasn't a tip-off to his inexperience, the awkwardness he carries himself with should be a dead giveaway. Call this man Donnie because he's out of his element. He was just a ring crew hand that was sacrificed in an effort to save the show. Though I think it was clear to most sound-minded individuals that at this stage, that was a lost cause. The decision to turn this into a tag team match was a split-second decision made in an effort to work around Jake. Yet despite all these last-minute changes to a product that was already in production, they still allowed him to remain in the ring most of the time. Jake is stripped of his shoes as the two heels take turns beating a man while he's already down. Finally, Jake tags out of the ring, and shortly thereafter, despite not actually being the legal man, he takes the pin. The heels walk off as their impromptu manager is taken hostage by the faces, and Yokozuna gets the crowd to chant DDT in preparation for Jake to hit his finish. A finish which will never come because Jake was too out of it to even know what was going on at this point, causing Yoko to instead hit this poor guy with a pretty painful looking Samoan drop. At which point, Jake then lets Damien crawl all over him to send the fans home deeply confused. Yokozuna helps Jake the Snake up off the ground, and the feed cuts. And that was Heroes of Wrestling, a villain of the industry. I can see why this is considered the worst of the worst. This was an all-time low for wrestling as a whole, but one that seemed to be put together under good intentions. Have you ever wanted to see a wrestling pay-per-view centered around a basketball star? If your response is anything other than, Excuse me, what? Then boy oh boy, do I have the show for you. Rodman Down Under is the first and last pay-per-view event of the short-lived iGeneration wrestling. But believe me, it was still one too many. I have so many questions that I don't think anyone can answer, and I don't even know the order to ask them in, so, so you know, just give me a second because there's a lot to unpack here. The commentary on the show is rough. Not only is it worse than it has any right being, but it's also the exact opposite of what you'd hope to hear. Typically, commentary teams are comprised of a face and heel commentator, a good guy announcer, and a bad guy announcer, who on occasion clash over the action going in the ring and the wrestler's moral compasses. The face commentator puts over the good guy, while the heel commentator defends and makes excuses for the villain. So a lot of the time, it will cause the two to clash. When done right, this could add to the product. When done wrong, it can do a lot to take away from it. But it doesn't matter, because you don't get that here. As Ted DiBiase commentates alongside Vince Mancini. And let me tell you, I don't know who Vince Mancini is, but I do know that I don't like him, very much so. His boring and bland commentary is only made that much worse when he spends the runtime sucking up to his co-commentator and taking jabs at the talent. It's not great, and it's especially at its worst in the first match. The commentators spend the entire match not actually transcribing what's going on in the ring, not by putting over the two legendary teams in this tag team match, but instead by clowning on Johnny Grunge for being fat. And I'm not saying they do it a little bit, I'm saying 
they do it the whole match. Hey, Johnny Grunge is so fat, he can't even get under that bottom rope. But the Warriors look in better shape than Public Enemy. I can't explain. Oh, look like Humpty Dumpty fall on there. Man, get that guy on a diet. The donut-sucking wrestler comes in. What kind of workout routine this guy's on? Yeah, lift the coffee into the donut. Gotta be careful, Grunge can hardly get his leg up that high. Johnny Grunge, fat form reject. Chubsy Wubsy breaking up the tag. Large and in charge. <laughs> Talk about a roll up. Surprise, they just roll right out of the ring. That's a jelly roll up, Ted. It's like a, like a turtle on his back. Johnny Grunge's instinct is to go to the local buffet. Where Grunge is concerned, though, you couldn't pin the guy. He's round. He can't ever get his shoulders flat. Oh, here comes Humpty Dumpty. Oh. I'm big, and I do stress big, Johnny Grunge. He deserves the Iron Man Award of Wrestling because he's carrying this team, and Johnny Grunge is a pretty big keystone to carry. And then you also get this when Fred Ottman comes out later. Sugar Daddy. That's an awful lot of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> they say a lot of sugar is not good for your weight. He's fat! All right, which one of you is supposed to be the good guy again? The commentary was taped out for the show, a fact made apparent not just from the bad green screen, but also when the camera show the commentary table, and it's clear that neither man that we saw before is seated there. Something they do their best to silently gloss over in commentary. The benefit of hindsight didn't help the two tell tonight's tale, as they're generally confused about what it is going on at all times, and even incorrectly guess how certain match stipulations work. To the benefit of this promotion, it does have a look. I'm not sure exactly what that look is, but it is a look nonetheless. The company's titles don't look too great though, and most importantly, they all look identical. It's not a good look to begin with, but then to just have it four times over makes me question uh, to what benefit is this? It feels like a really lazy attempt from a company chock full of lazy attempts. In between each and every match, the iGenerates come down to the ring to perform. Ah uh, yes, another 2000s fed, another discount Nitro Girls. This was, this was definitely a thing at the time. Which is strange because it's only worked for one company and that's the one that started this. And it didn't even work all the time for them. The show opens up with a video package that shows NBA star Dennis Rodman attacking the former Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning following world title victory. During that attack, a tumultuous history between the two is referenced, and I think that they're referencing their time in WCW, but I, I don't even know if they've ever interacted back in the day. I know they were both in the NWO, but yeah, like them and 30 other people at the same time. You would really have to search to find a picture of the two standing side by side. I just don't know if that history hits as hard as they're making it sound like it does. The two will be competing tonight for Henning's IGW World Championship, to which the commentators proudly proclaim it's wrestling, wrestling meets, meets basketball. basketball. Uh, no offense, but, uh, but who is clamoring to see that crossover? How does being a basketball player help you be a wrestler? His time in WCW is never acknowledged outright, and the commentators treat him as a first-time wrestler for the most part. Which is strange because he's clearly wrestled publicly on a much grander scale than this with opponents who were arguably bigger stars than Kurt Henning. Though I don't, I don't know who would even try to argue that point. The show starts off with Kurt Henning calling out his main event opponent early on, to which the worm responds, standing at the ramp and cutting a typical heel promo. Which, again, kind of confuses me. You have the show named after a celebrity guest in your company, who's not even being booked as a babyface? I mean, at least the return of Robocop was named after the good guy. Following this, we're shown a brawl that took place at a press conference between two major tag teams, the Road Warriors and Public Enemy. This is to set up this tag team tables match with the company's tag team titles on the line. Except this doesn't seem to operate like your standard tables match, as the two teams are trying to score pinfalls throughout. And it doesn't go by tornado rules either, meaning that the teams need to tag each other in during a tables match. Oh, and both men on each team have to be put through a table and pinned to win. I, I think, I guess. If you're confused at home listening to this, don't worry about it because so was the commentary team watching it, who scrambled to figure out what exactly the rules are, which is even funnier when you realize the commentary was recorded at a later date. So I guess just no one felt the need to inform Ted DiBiase and friend. They gotta put both guys through a table to win, is that not correct? That's exactly what happens. Fuck with the cover! But Ted, the only way to win the match is to put your guy through the table. That's wrestling instinct right there. The turtle on his back. 
a minute, why are these guys instinctively going for the count, Ed? It's just instinct. I also realized that apparently all of Rocco Rock's heel work just consists of him randomly looking at the crowd and shouting shut up repeatedly. I mean, I get it, it's classic. That, that's old reliable in terms of bad guy antics in the ring, but... You know, usually people wait to be booed first. If you're familiar with both teams and what both teams were capable of doing around this time, you know what you're gonna get. Brawling. All in all, I actually thought strange match type aside, that this was alright. Not good, but alright. From what it looks like, these two tag teams were the company's only tag teams, and they literally trade the belts back and forth at every show. Wow, how exciting. Up next, the Barber takes on the Barbarian in a hardcore match. That's right, directly after a tables match, we get a hardcore match. Not really a whole lot of diversity in terms of match types tonight, huh? The commentary team even makes a note of this. I guess hardcore just means we're gonna use different furniture, right? Brutus Beefcake is introduced as Brute Force, which makes that, what, gimmick 15 or 16 now? But he enters wearing his Mega Maniacs tights? Look, the same way Horace shouldn't be allowed to carry the last name Hogan, Brutus Beefcake shouldn't be allowed to wear the red and yellow when Hulk isn't in attendance. But it's alright because neither man can do as much damage to the name Hogan as Hulk himself. The match is everything you'd expect it to be, and less. While both men have had their share of matches, I wouldn't even call this match a walk and brawl, it's more like a stroll and beat. The pace is slow and they're off, just kind of feels like they're making it up as they're going along, and not really doing a great job at disguising that. There's not a story being told here, it's just two dudes doing whatever comes to mind. And hey, a lot of people do that. Not everyone sits down to figure out every single little intricacy of their match. But even in saying that, they usually get better results. It's pretty bad and it just meanders. Until eventually the man with no name hits all the finishers he's been storing up, only to eat a boot and take the pin. Psychology. What is that? The first and last women's match of the night sees Brandy Wine, who looks like an indie riffic sable, with her manager Sugar Daddy, which in actuality is the Shockmaster hitting a brand new low. Taking on Sweet Destiny, who enters the ring alongside legendary boxer Aussie Joe, a man most renowned for going toe to toe with Muhammad Ali. Why is he involved? Why is he wearing a ref's uniform? It's Rodman down under, man. I, I don't ask questions. What sense is there in trying to make sense of any of this? This match is a low point in a night that has yet to have a high point. It's filled with botches, bad timing, and what looks like two people exercising the two moves they know in a span of 11 minutes. Something's supposed to happen at the end, but they're not in the proper places, so they just have to randomly adjust and find their way into place. And it's not exactly seamless. The highlight of the match doesn't even involve the participants, as Aussie Joe gets involved and hits Sugar Daddy, who strangely sells it as being stunned for a millisecond before getting back up just to argue with the guy. Oh, that's that's great. Uh, suffice it to say, Trish and Lita this was not, though that hair flip looked kind of cool. Sweet Destiny wins and nobody cares. Well, Ted, let me ask you this. You've been around wrestling for a while. Do these girls fit in with some of the greats that have been around? Oh, definitely. Tatanka defends his IGW Australasian Championship against One Man Gang in a match that is just a match. I know that's a weird thing to say, but this match is your standard match. There's nothing truly terrible about it. It's not a botch-filled disaster or mistimed mess. It's just that it's not all that entertaining, all things considered. It's competent in ring work from two guys who are capable of better had they been on a bigger stage and less time been removed from their prime. Though to be fair, Tatanka was still six years away from his long-awaited WWE return. Yeah, you remember that? It's okay, nobody does. At one point, One Man Gang randomly threatens to leave, but then immediately makes his way back to the ring. And say what you will about the quality or lack thereof in this match, One Man Gang proves that he's still a quality heel by inciting the crowd to pelt him with garbage. Personally, I think the match's biggest problem is that it was afforded too much time. Had it been condensed down to a shorter, simpler match, it probably would have made a much better impression. In wrestling, sometimes less is more. And this was more than enough. It was just too much of nothing of note. Again, the match isn't awful, but it is awfully boring. When something interesting does happen, it's in between long bouts of boredom, and it's not enough to make up for the filler that led up to the spot. 
Ultimately, the bad guy cheats, gets the win, taking the title to become the new IGW Australian Alaskan champion, or whatever it's called. After a mandatory dance break, it's time for a main event, as the once perfect Kurt Henning puts his world championship title on the line against the worm, Dennis Rodman. Now what's important to note is that this is an Australian Outback match, which really just means that it's yet another hardcore match. And what's equally important is that despite it being the main event match, it is not a main event quality match. It's another walk and brawl that relies heavily on the use of weapons, something we've seen all too much of tonight. You gotta give credit to Kurt, who works around Rodman's greener nature and inexperience. Selling his offense like a champ and almost making him feel like a credible challenger in just the way that he presented it. Kurt was working with what he got, and he did the best that he could. It's clear who was leading this match, as Kurt barely hides that he's talking to Rodman and the ref throughout, calling spots at a very audible volume. To Rodman's credit, he looks a lot more comfortable and capable here than he did in his WCW run. I mean, he's not Luthez by any means, but the guy's properly selling and tossing himself around the ring, and even manages to hit a move or two that looks interesting. This match is actually passable if you're judging it on a curve, but that being said, I would still pass on it if I had the opportunity. And any near goodwill it built up goes out the window in the finish, where Rodman gets disqualified in a no disqualification match. Rodman attacks the officials, causing the match to be called off. So the babyface Henning, out of frustration, then goes on to attack more officials after the match. Great! The two proceed to brawl until Aussie Joe and Brutus Beefcake wind up getting involved to tear the two apart. The event ends with Henning getting checked on by medical staff in the back where he tells cameras that Dennis Rodman doesn't, doesn't belong, belong in the, the wrestling, wrestling business. business. What a note to end this on. The already half-empty arena fully empties as the commentators pat the promotion and each other on the back for a brilliant event to close the show off. And that was Rodman Down Under. I don't know what that was, and I don't know why that was, but I can confirm that that was. The WXO was a short-lived company that rose and fell in the year 2000. The company only managed to put together three shows, none of which did much to set the wrestling world on fire. The Fed had some star power attached with the former Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase acting as the CEO, and Repo Man Barry Darso booking the shows. They also brought in plenty of names that weren't booked elsewhere, with their roster consisting of the likes of Barry Darso, Eric Watts, and Scott Nash. Okay, uh, maybe they weren't exactly all A-listers, but they did actually have a few names in their time. There's something else that should be stated. While Ted DiBiase seems like an ideal choice for an evil general manager, the guy had all the money in the world, a penchant for telling everyone about it, and an evil cackle to top it all off. The problem here is that the company wasn't run by that bad guy billionaire, but instead by the man who once played that character. Gone was the everybody has a price, and in its place was everybody gets a chance. And this really exposed the fact that his charisma apparently was attached to that character. And without him playing that part, he wasn't all that entertaining. As a character, he was always on high energy, but as a person, he's devoid of any energy. The show was commentated by Sweet Stan Lane and Chris Cruz. Not that that matters for reasons we'll get into. Now, before I even go into the show, I know what everyone watching this must be wondering, and that's what does the WXO stand for? I don't know! It doesn't seem like it stands for anything. They're just letters. Your name is Letters? All names are Letters, dickhead. While I may not be able to tell you what the name of the show was, what I can assure you is that this was a family show. And I know this because they wouldn't shut up about it. They feel the need to mention it every time they try to promote the show. So it's clear that this was really a selling point for them. But who were they trying to sell this to? This was wrestling during the Attitude Era where fans wanted more rowdy, adult-oriented shows. The commentary does their best to keep things squeaky clean, which, as you might imagine, when dealing with a seemingly violent sport, isn't always the easiest thing to do. I'm not saying I need the commentators to curse or act out, but even PG Era Raws had much more loose guidelines and more descriptive commentary. What makes matters worse is that the commentary team has a bad double standard, where they won't curse, but they will catcall their female employees any chance they get. Look, all I'm saying is be consistent. 
Jerry Lawler sexualized the women's locker room and still managed to call a match. Not that commentary is too much of a problem here, as you can barely hear the discussion of the match over the audience, who are just on their feet all night, except any time that they're actually shown. The sound was very badly sweet, which really sours me on the whole show. At the show, the crowd was mild, but in post, the crowd went wild. It's weird because it's an endless loop of a crowd loving what they're seeing over footage of a crowd who's mostly uninterested in what they were given. It's a very bizarre mashup. And speaking of bizarre mashups, the very first match of the show, and in the company's history, is kind of symbolic of the product itself, as this is the most random assortment of men I have ever seen in my life. As nepotism hire Eric Watts teams with founder of CZW, Zandig, to take on the team of one half of the Fantastics, Tommy Rogers, and future general manager of Raw, Adam Pearce. I don't know who thought to put these two teams together and then against each other, but it feels like the Bookers were just randomizing universe mode. It's an odd random pairing versus another odd random pairing. Because of this, I don't think the two teams work particularly well together. Their inexperience in teaming together is definitely working against them. But no one does a bad job individually. Uh, except for Eric. Eric is not looking great out there. I, I think we could agree that he wasn't necessarily the greatest second generation wrestler. The guy was not the Cody of his generation. Sometimes the second generation stars are rightfully overshadowed by their more famous fathers. And this was one of those times. Although I'm gonna give him credit that no one else seems to afford him, but I don't think he was all that bad. He was a hammy over actor with animated facial features when selling moves and moments. Now that may not sound like a lot, but honestly, it's a part of the gig. And it's a part of the gig that I feel not everyone has. His character work wasn't bad either. He knew how to play a heel. It might have been the most basic version of a heel, and he was bound to be hated due to his status anyway, but, you know, it, it, it's something. However, he'd also miss cues, botch moves, and just show a lack of in-ring awareness. Which are all things he does throughout this match. It feels like the rest of the workers have to work around his inability. And that's despite the fact that Adam Pearce was only a few years into the industry at this point in time. Yet despite this, he's still made to work most of the match. Cause, yeah, alright, sure, why not? Anyway, Eric Watson's and Dick win. Not a great start to the show, but I don't blame the four guys in the ring. I blame the guy who put those four guys in the ring. Up next, it's Maniac Manny Fernandez taking on Sean Hill. Now, I don't know what Maniac Manny is, but it's almost something. It feels like he's going for a more wacky, PG-oriented gold dust, and I don't hate it until later when I do, but, but initially, I don't hate it. Unfortunately, these types of gimmicks always have the potential to be really interesting and unique, but they also have the potential to just come off as a parody of pro wrestling when they're done wrong. Regardless, it feels like the character could use a little bit more work and definitely could use a lot less kissing. At some point early on, Manny takes down his straps and then has to spend the remainder of the match pulling up his tights. He struggles more with his singlet than he does with his opponent. Speaking of his opponent, Sean Hill, on the other hand, just randomly takes the time to dance around the ring. Maybe I'd appreciate the two if I was more aware of their work and what it was they were trying to do, but as a first-time presentation, this tells me nothing about either man uh, other than they're both odd. The match is fine at first, the two hit some impressive moves, sell each other's offense, and have a believable back and forth bout. Aside from Stardust Sr. no-selling a beautifully landed moonsault and then kicking out of one. The match comes to an end when Maniac Manny crotches himself on the top turnbuckle, no-sells the injury, laughs, and then hits a flying headbutt for the pin. Just like the first match, I'm left a little bit confused by what it was I've just witnessed and what it is they want me to take from this. Let's just say this is definitely far from my favorite maniac in pro wrestling. The maniac loves you. The show builds up the arrival of some megastar, but we're only shown a shot of him from the back. Now, the superstar is supposed to be anonymous until his big reveal, except the issue is, is that anybody who's ever seen the guy would recognize him from his distinct look, posture, and gray sweatshirt. That's clearly Dan the Beast Severed. It literally could be nobody else. This was as obvious as the time a masked Kerry Von Erich ran down to the ring with a bedazzled Kerry jacket. Eventually, Ted DiBiase brings the Beast to the ring and introduces him to the audience. 
Now, Severn is an incredibly underappreciated worker. A skilled boxer, a solid wrestler, and an accomplished fighter. One of his talents, however, was not talking. So hearing him speak hurts almost as much as getting into the ring with him would. As Severn speaks highly about his past accolades and talks himself up, the locker room emboldens famous jobber Al Green to step up to the beast, which goes about as well as one might expect. Severn locks in an ankle lock as the rest of the roster watches on in horror, until Barry Horowitz, of all people, rushes to the ring and starts a brawl to distract everyone and save Al Green in the process, for some reason. Once again, I have no idea what's going on. Believe it or not, the next match sees the entrance of Nash. Scott Nash, that is. An obvious dig at the outsiders Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. Calling him Bargain Bin Big Sexy, or Dollar Store Diesel, or We Have NWO at Home, doesn't do this injustice justice. This jobber was made only to get a pop that never came. And considering that Barry Darso is also the booker of this show, squashing a parody of one of the biggest stars and bookers of WCW really makes this feel like this was some sort of vendetta, or, or a statement being made. I, I don't know what that statement would have been, but it, it was certainly heard nonetheless. Again, that's just how things look, though I'm sure that's not the case. In recent years, Nash has been very vocal about wanting to see Demolition in the WWE Hall of Fame. Anyway, the match ends when Mike Enos, who was involved in that previous segment with Darso, shows up and hits him with a chair. The match doesn't end in a DQ, but instead a countout. So Scott Nash is victorious. Yep, only a matter of time before he teams up with Randy Hogan to start the WON. The main event sees the team of the bodies, Armbiter A. Steel and Danny Dominion, versus the team of the Heartbreakers, Adonis and Apollo, with their manager Giamor. Yes, this show both starts and ends with a tag team match, but at least this one seems to have two actual tag teams. The match is by far the best on the card, everyone in the ring is beyond competent and comfortable working together, the two teams have a good back and forth trading offense, and both looking fairly impressive in their own right. They have some creative spots, and while I really know nothing about these two teams, I am at least enjoying watching them. Ace Steel's selling is probably the highlight of this match for me. The match isn't anything special, but it's a solid outing, and unlike everything else on the show, doesn't feel ruined in both concept and execution. It's a breath of fresh air on a show that felt like a total dud otherwise, but unfortunately, it does eventually fall in line with the rest of the show ending this match and this episode with an awful and awfully bizarre finish. The fight is taken to the outside when the Heartbreakers try to heal it up and attack the bodies with steel chairs from the crowd. An audience member, who the camera shown multiple times throughout the night, suddenly interferes and grabs the chair from the Heartbreakers, causing the team to turn on the fan and beat him down. And then this causes the other team to also join in on the beating. And that's when an identical fan from further up in the rafters rushes down to the ring to save his clone. But if they're identical twins, and they attended the same wrestling show together, why, why would they be sitting so far apart? You know, you know what, never mind. Questioning it just makes it last longer. Yeah, that question's not even worth asking, because that would imply everything else up until this point in time made sense. Which it did not. This was one of the worst wrestling shows I've ever seen. Ever. I mean, Heroes of Wrestling was awful, but at least it had the decency to be so bad it was entertaining. You know, th th that was something to talk about. This wasn't even that. This was so bad that I forgot what it was I was watching while I was watching it. Still, there are two more episodes left, so if you'd like to see a video on the final two episodes of this short-lived stint of a company, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, You know, you can't just Ted DiBiase all of our dreams, dude. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V Generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one. Bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Get out.
Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.